happy to introduce Professor Avis Cohen. Uh, Professor Avis Cohen received her PhD from Cornell University in uh, 1977. She held a postdoctoral position in Karolinska Institute in Sweden and then in Washington University in St. Louis. And then she returned to Cornell University for her own lab, uh, which is where she uh, started a very impressive collaborative effort, uh, which was described as a uh, a collaborative effort to put the lamprey back together again. That is the use of mathematical, physiological, behavioral, and biomechanical studies. Um, it was in this collaboration that she and her colleagues developed groundbreaking theoretical treatments of systems of coupled nonlinear oscillators. And uh, as Cornell, she also began exploring the process of spinal cord regeneration in lamprey. Um, Dr. Cohen, then uh, Professor Cohen then joined the University of Maryland, Department of Biology in 1990. Uh, over the next eight years, she established and directed the program in neuroscience and cognitive science, uh, which was one of the first in the United States. Uh, it was an interdisciplinary graduate program, uh, very similar to ours, I guess. Yes. Uh, Nothing is similar to ours. <laughs> <laughs> Ours is better. Ours is broader because it includes uh, engineering as well. Uh, during these years, uh, Cohen also began working with uh, the Terrorite Group, um, which is a very uh, nice uh, workshop for neuromotic engineering that I attended last summer and met Avis there. Um, she was also the funding director of the advanced program funded by NSF to increase and retain women faculty in science, engineering, and technology. And her talk today, uh, as the title suggests, describes a, a journey, which is, my, in my own, own words, is from a very cool lamprey to very, very cool robots. Put out of us. I wish I could give the talk in Hebrew, but uh, I'm afraid not. So I apologize profusely, but you would not want to hear it in Hebrew from me. Um, so uh, I do apologize, but um, that's the way it is. Uh, so. Try to speak up a bit. Ah, yes. Okay. Sorry. Right, okay. Can you hear me now in the back? No. Put the microphone. Oh, it's covered. Yeah, here's. Uh, but you just have to know that even if the scope will be good, it would give me English. <laughs> How's that? Can you hear me in the back? Good. Okay. Um, so this is an interdisciplinary journey uh, that began in, um, uh, and I do, by the way, I, I welcome, uh, and this is also how I learned I was an engineer. You have to remember that I was born at an age when women did not become engineers. Uh, it was bad enough that they became biologists, but certainly they did not go into engineering. Uh, if I'd been born 20 years later, I probably would have been an engineer, but so be it. It's a two-part journey. Uh, the first part is the lamprey spinal cord and mathematics, and the second part is uh, motor principles obtained that I then took to robots and had fun playing with toys. Uh, it all began chatting with Phil Holmes <coughs> over the Xerox machine in Cornell, in the Cornell Math Department in 1980. And this led to a collaboration with Richard Rand and Phil Holmes. So you might say, well, what was this all about? And the first thing I would say is, well, we've got to meet the lamprey first. Uh, this is an urban legend image of the lamprey. It is not really what they look like. This is the mouth of the real lamprey. And although it's not quite as shriveled, it is just as, um, how should we say, beautiful, no. Uh, scary, a little. Um, it's a mouth. It's a round mouth. It does not have jaws. Uh, it is called Nine Eyes in Europe and Eight Eyes in Japan for reasons that I am not entirely clear. It's a good vertebrate. Uh, all the characteristics of a higher vertebrate, but it's, if you know the evolutionary tree, it's at the bottom of the vertebrate tree. So it's not primitive, as some people would say it's basal, which is the proper language. We don't talk about primitive, that's insulting, we talk about basal. 
So it's a basal lamprey. Uh, it is jawless, as I said. Uh, it's a basal vertebrate. The lamprey nervous system, on the other hand, has the same organization as we do. So it's very convenient. Uh, and it is possible to dis demonstrate a direct evolutionary path from the lamprey uh, in control of locomotion from lamprey to human. And I did this in 1987 in a book that I was edited at that time. Now, here's the whole animal. Uh, and you probably want to see more about it. It has no appendages. Is there a pointer somewhere? By the way, it has no appendages. You'll see that, notice along the body, there's nothing sticking out, OK? So there's no appendages on this animal. It has fins on its back and its belly, but no appendages. It swims with a traveling wave motion, as you, as you can somewhat see there, but I'll show you more evidence. Um, and they were invited, but turned down. So, uh, this is, um, now we get in a little bit of talking about what is being discussed. This is an animal, I'm holding it, so you can get some perspective on the size of an adult. This is, a, it's about yay big, and so big around. Uh, there are bigger ones, but I don't use them. Uh, they are a little unnerving to use, but uh, these are fine. Uh, the lamprey swimming is, you see that on the top, now I do need a pointer, but I can, oh, here he comes, yeah. Ah, thank you, yeah, okay, all right, okay. Yeah, as you see, the, um, this is going sequentially through time, and the wave travels along, well, this, is what, this one's flipping off, the wave travels along the body, uh, and I'm always having trouble with this wave. Where is, oh, I see. It goes from here to here to here. It's not obvious, but never mind. It does. It's a traveling wave. <laughs> you know, my husband is pointing out the wave. He's a topologist, so he can see it better than I can. In any case, uh, this is the. If you look at this animal, and now you stick electrodes into the muscles at two places here and here what you'll see is this periodic bursting, uh, which is alternating strictly between left and right. There's this one and this one. This is one and three. So they're strictly alternating. And two and four are strictly alternating as these two. Um, and then you'll also see that along the body, one to two, there's a wave. There's a delay, OK? Notice that there's no time marker on this. Regardless of how fast the animal swims, that wave will have the same temporal relationship along the body. So the phase relationships, the distance from here to here divided by the time of the, of the, tra of the cycle will remain constant. Is that clear? Because that's, that's critical. That's really important. Okay? So there's this constant phase relationship regardless of how fast the animal swims. Okay? So this is what we're going to start talking about first. Okay. The traveling wave moves down the body. Left and right sides alternate. And it travels uniformly along the body. Okay. And there's this constant phase relationship. And this is data taken from um, Thelma Williams and Peter Balayan. And Peter and I showed this exact pattern in animals, well, in the isolated spinal cord of the animals uh, in 1980. This was done in 1982. Okay. Now, if you take the spinal cord out of the animal and you put it in a dish like this, and you record along the body several, several places, and this is work by Nick Mellon in my laboratory, um, what you will see is this, excuse me, uh, this wave along here. So in fact, you see that it is pretty uniform. Interestingly, there are what are called edge effects. So it's a little bit longer here and a little bit shorter here. And that has to do with the fact that it's been cut and taken out of the body. So there are these edge effects, but they're not dramatic. Presumably, the inside the body, these are taken care of. So the isolated spinal cord is capable of what we could say swimming, okay? It can swim 
in the dish with only, um, there's no muscles attached, there's no brain attached, there's no sensory feedback, there's nothing except the isolated spinal cord sitting in the dish. Okay? This was the ultimate proof that the spinal cord generated locomotion. It did not need the brain, it did not need sensory feedback, all it needed was to be activated. And the brain turned it on, and then the spinal cord did the rest. Uh, and this was work that I did with Peter Valand. Well, not this particular experiment, but this was later. But the initial demonstration was with Peter Valand in Sten Grillner's laboratory in 1980. Um, so this is the final proof that the isolated vertebrate spinal cord produced all the pattern for locomotion. Okay, is that clear? Because that's critical. Okay, now, in the lamprey spinal cord, this is a cross-section of the lamprey spinal cord, and people always want to know, well, how big is it? It's a good question. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, let me first show you that it has all the components of a normal spinal cord. Here, in the center, is what we call the gray. This is where cell bodies are, and it's uniform across the gray here. And then around the outside are cells, are, sorry, axons. Now you might say, what are these huge things? These huge things are axons. They're huge. These have very large axons that go along the uh, dorsal side, the bottom side of the spinal cord. This cell is a, um, I think that's actually a serotonin cell, but I'm not positive about that. Uh, in any case, here's the central canal. And here are dorsal fibers going out, or I'm sorry, coming in from sensory roots. And here should be ventral roots going out to motor fibers. The whole thing, and this is looking down on it, so you here see this is, um, let me get oriented, this is the center. Yeah, this is the center. So this is fibers, fibers, cells, cells, fibers, fibers. So it's the same organization that we have in our spinal cord, uh, looking at it in that way. Um, now, what preserves coordination uh, in this animal? So you've got the fact that this spinal cord has this extraordinary coordination along it with no sensory feedback. That's quite a difficult computation, if you think about it. It's preserving that, that uh, constant phase delay with no input, no input at all. And the question is, how in heaven's name is it doing it? It's not at all clear. So you also first want to know, how are the, the segments, these are the different segments, how are the segments connected to each other to give, you know, is there some information in that? You know, for example, in the early studies on coordination, what they did, and this is why I put this little, this little, surgical, um, is because the early experiments on coordination in invertebrates, the first thing they did is they cut to see what preserved coordination. If I cut this little piece, coordination is gone. Aha, the fibers for coordination live there. Okay? So I did the same thing in the lamprey. Where are the coordinating fibers? Well, very interesting. So you make small cuts or lesions to interrupt coordination. So here's one example. This is looking at a cross-section of a spinal cord. This is one edge. This is the other edge. This is cell, uh, these are fibers, 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 cells, cells, and this is the cut. That's quite a large cut. It left this and this intact. So you say, aha! That's where the coordinating fibers are, right? Well, let's see. No, because if I make this cut in another animal, this is a different animal, if I make this cut and I leave only these, you still preserve coordination. Hmm. So it's only the fibers that do it. Okay, it's the fibers. Okay, I can live with that, it's the fibers. No. 
because if you make this cut in another animal, you cut these fibers and these fibers and these fibers and leave this and this, you still preserve coordination. Well, this is saying that this is a very complicated system. Now, some biologists, like me, I'm a perverse person, like complexity. Others don't. So most people didn't want to pay any attention to this because it made life too difficult for them. So they pretty much ignored this result. <coughs> um, this, let's see. Oh, yeah. Now here is a summary of lesions in different animals. And the black lines, each one of these is a cut that was made in one animal. Okay, this is just a summary diagram. And the solid ones destroyed coordination, and the open ones preserved it. So it shows actually kind of an interesting difference here, because some of, the, some of them you could make very large cuts, and you don't destroy coordination. In others, you make relatively small cuts. Uh, well, actually, this one is not so small, but let's see. This one, yeah, this one here is the best example to go against these. In others, you can make a smaller cut, and it does destroy coordination. So clearly, the differences between spinal cords is different. So what are the kinds of differences? Again, we get into complexity. What is going on? What are the complexities that we're looking at? Okay, so, so what? That's one question you might ask, so what? The neural network that generates this pattern is what we call the CPG. And I'm going to use this term a lot. So get used to CPG, or Central Pattern Generator, okay? The CPG is the neural network that generates the pattern of activity, okay? It's the generator for locomotion. There's also a generator for respiration. There's also a generator for scratch. These are neural networks that are in the animal or human when you're born. You don't need to teach them. They are there without learning. Okay? So we all have them. And what can we say on the basis of what we've just seen? What can we say about the structure of this network? Well, the network must generate oscillations and preserve the traveling wave. Okay? We know that much. Not much more. So the first thing that uh, one of, uh, I think this was done by Karen Sigvard in Sten Grillner's lab, what she did is she poked a cell in the spinal cord with an electrode. And for those of you who are not biologists and never poked a cell, uh, this is fairly standard procedure. You just take a sharp needle, you poke into a cell, and you can record what it's, what it's doing. Uh, and if you put in what's called TTX, tetrodotoxin, that will stop the action potentials, the spikes that you see that go between cells. And then you can see what the cell is doing when there's no action potentials talking to each other. That's not to say there's no communication, but it is to say that there's no action potentials t talking to each other. We will not go into the glial interactions possible. We will not go into non-spiky interactions possible, but all the spiky interactions have been blocked. Okay? Then you see these oscillations. So within, that means a pretty much a local network is oscillating. So what you have is a segmental, pardon? That's right, that's a single cell. So it's probably, there may be other cells connected to it that are oscillating because of non-spiking um, non interactions. We know that those interactions exist in the lamprey. We also know that they have glial cells, and who knows what the glial cells are doing? Pardon? I'm sorry? Yes, we didn't do that. They didn't do that, but you could do it. Uh, but uh, I think the junctions in the lamprey, that's a problem with the lamprey. Not all of these things work as well in lamprey as they do in some of the other animals. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know that Grillner has ever tried that, but um, you know, that would have been something for his lab to do. Okay. So this is an intracellular recording from an interneuron in the presence of TTX. Membrane potentials oscillating most likely due to intrinsic properties of the membrane. 
activated by NMDA receptors, for example, because this is a pattern of activity activated by NMDA, neural uh, N-methyl D aspartate. Thank you. Um, and this is a neurotransmitter which is acting as a glutamate agonist, and it does generate oscillations in many cells. So it would not be surprising if this is an a NMDA-induced oscillation in the cell. It's typical, um, and therefore we suggest that segmental or unit oscillator consists of both induced oscillators and network oscillators. Experimental evidence and models have suggested a basic structure but incomplete knowledge, as opposed to what Grilmer claims, by the way. He says, oh, it's all figured out. Uh, excuse me, it is not all figured out. Uh, but never mind, we will leave that aside. Okay, in any case, the typical segmental oscillator or unit oscillator consists of both these induced oscillators uh, like this and networks of oscillators like inhibitors that cut across. So you've got this excitator cell, and you've got an inhibitory cell coming in and saying, stop, enough, and so on, back and forth. So you have both of these going on. Okay, now... In order to get at the behavior of these segmental oscillators, one of the things that I first started to do was to cut cords into two pieces, just to cut them apart and see what are the frequencies above and below that cut. When you separate the pieces, what do they do? Do they become very different? Do they stay the same? What happens to the frequencies when you take them apart? So, interestingly, and some of you may recognize this woman, that's Nancy Capel, famous mathematician, um, she predicted the result, and it was very interesting that um, she predicted it, and I said, no, Nancy, it's not going to work. She said, yes, it is, and she won the bet. And it's not very common that mathematicians win the bets over biologists, but she did it. So her intuition was better than ours. All right, so uh, frequencies along the spinal cord are random. Okay, so here you have... Three different, these are three different sets of animals. In this animal, you have the rostral, the head end, is faster. And the caudal end, the tail end, is slow. Okay? In this one, it's the other way around. The tail is faster than the head. And here, they're roughly equal. Three different animals, three different results. Okay? Oscillators have characteristic frequencies. Yep. Intersegmental coupling, which has been cut between these, has been preserving a single frequency across these, but when you separate them, they go to their characteristic frequencies. Um, now, interestingly, you can argue, well, how many segments makes an oscillator? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Four? Five? Is it how many? That remains an open question because negative results in this business prove very little. Nobody has gotten a single segment to oscillate by itself in any kind of stable way. Does that mean that it is not a single oscillator? No. It just means you, we didn't, haven't figured out the way to do it yet. So we don't know whether a single oscillator can do this or not. However, what we can say is that each segment is a limit cycle oscillator. What does that mean? For the mathematicians in the crowd, this is not an unusual concept, I suspect. It means a nonlinear oscillator that once it starts, it spirals up to this, this outer limit cycle, and it goes around. If it gets kicked off of it, it comes back around and gets back on it again. Okay? That is what's called a limit cycle, a nonlinear limit cycle oscillator. It's a very powerful concept in mathematics because these guys are very stable. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm confusing. Kind of. I'm sorry. Uh, once you get an oscillator to go, it is a limit cycle oscillator. Is a single segment a limit cycle oscillator if it's not an oscillator? I can't say that. I don't know. All I can say is that when you get the oscillator going, 
whether it takes one, two, three, four, five, whatever number of segments, it will be a limit cycle oscillator. The whole system? The system of those cells will become a limit cycle oscillator. The system of those segments? That's right. That's right. Whether a single cell is a limit cycle oscillator, I have no clue. I doubt it, actually. You I don't think it's that stable. Themselves. I'm sorry? You never tried dissociating your section. That has been tried, but it turns out that dissociated lamprey cells are not very happy cells. Uh, people have tried it, but not very successfully. So, um, we can talk about it later if you like. Um, okay. Now, the impact of perturbations, what does it mean? A limit cycle oscillator has some very nice properties because one of the things is that if you perturb a limit cycle oscillator, depending on where you perturb it, you will get a different response. The perturbation will cause a different effect whether it's here or here or here or here. It will go off the limit cycle and then it will come back on again. And you can analyze you can break apart the pieces of that perturbation and then its, its response to that perturbation, and you can characterize the change. And it's been done very beautifully in a paper by uh, Leon Glass, very nice paper. Um, and the stimulation does not change the properties of the limit cycle. And this was done, um, Leon did this in physical review. It's a theoretical paper, but he's referring to cardiac cells, but it's the same principle. So it's a very, I highly recommend this paper for those of you who are interested in the properties of limit cycle oscillators in a biological context because it's very, very pretty paper. Uh, and this graph has come from this guy's the student at Harvard, his, uh, one of his, his research papers. Okay. Now, the importance of limit cycle oscillators are one, that it does guarantee the phase dependent perturbation, as I said. Uh, which we'll see the importance of in a bit. And the quadrant will specify the impact of the perturbation, as I said. And more importantly, the most important thing about a limit cycle oscillator or about a nonlinear oscillator altogether is that the frequency is not going to be changed by a perturbation. If you think of a linear oscillator, if you perturb it, it will go to the new frequency and stay there. That's not what a nonlinear oscillator does. If you perturb a nonlinear oscillator, it returns to the original frequency and stays there, okay? Unless you kick it and keep kicking it and keep kicking it, in which case you're forcing it onto a new frequency. And you can do that. But if you don't do that, it will go to a new frequency and, st and it will just go to the back to the old frequency and stay there. And it makes it a very stable kind of oscillation. And that's very important for things like breathing and locomotion and all these other kinds of biological oscillators. Most biological oscillators are nonlinear. Makes them difficult to study mathematically, but well, what can you say? Tough. <laughs> the way it is, they have to be. So uh, engineers don't like it, but mathematicians don't like it, but that's what it is. It has to be there. Okay. Now, modeling the CPG as a system of coupled oscillators, and this is work from Cohen, Holmes, and Rand in 1982, before many of you were even born. Uh, and it was this result that we started hatching over the Xerox <coughs> machine. And what uh, Phil had just arrived at Cornell and he was looking for problems and I described what we had, the results we had, and he said, oh, that sounds like a great project that he and Richard would like to deal with, they'd like to work on. So I brought them my data and we started talking about it and they came up with this theory. And it's a very beautiful, very elegant, very simple theory of coupled nonlinear oscillators. Okay, so this was later generalized by Capel and Ermentrout, and it has been the general framework for a whole bunch of theoretical work on coupled oscillators for almost 30 years. And I've had people come up to me that this young man from Russia who had learned about this work when he was a student in Russia, and he was so excited, he wanted to meet me. This is the work that was most important in his career, and I was just stunned. <laughs> it, was, it was very heartwarming. It was really lovely. Um, so this, this work has really been quite, uh, quite important. And it's very simple. You start, if you want to couple two oscillators, and that's the easiest way to think of it, you simply have the uh, theta, um, which is the theta dot is the change 
in the, in the cycle, the perturbation, and it's equal to the frequency of that oscillator plus this coupling term. And the H function is a periodic function, uh, just some periodic function. Uh, and this is a constant that you multiply it by, and this is the phase difference between these two oscillators. And then you have another one for the other term, the other oscillator. And this is how you define them. And if you have a chain of oscillators, this is the equation. It's simply just adding these equations together. So it's a very, very simple, conceptually simple theory. Mathematically, it was non-trivial, but conceptually, it's beautiful and simple. Okay? So it, um, it really worked very well. And it led to this image for the lamprey spinal cord. Uh, and let me, yeah, two segments per oscillator. So you have a left and a right in each segment, and they're coupled up and down, a coupled across and up and down. And the oscillators are nonlinear limit cycle oscillators, and with all that implies. Now, notice that I've made all these arrows bidirectional. Okay? There is both ascending and descending coupling at all levels of the spinal cord. And this is crucial. This is really important. And this is something, again, that Sten would like to leave out of his models. He is only descending. Um, so, and somebody has a phone call. Okay. Now, the assumptions of the original model. And by going through these assumptions, for those of you who've never worked with a mathematician, the first thing you want to know is, what are the assumptions we're going to use? Okay? These are the assumptions you start with. And then you go to your conclusions, and you assume that the mathematician does the sums in the, in the middle correctly. Okay? I'm not a dynamicist. I don't try to solve dynamical systems. But I assume with those assumptions, get these conclusions, that they've done the math right. Okay. Now, so what are the assumptions? And the other thing about assumptions is that assumptions are to be disproven. You cannot prove an assumption. All you can do is disprove an assumption. Or you can show under certain circumstances it's correct. doesn't mean it's correct under all circumstances. That's something else that people don't understand in modeling. In a model, you don't try to prove the model. You can never prove a model is correct. You must never get wedded to your model because you're going to get divorced. And it's not going to be a happy ending if you get all tied up in it. You want to say, oh, okay, bye. It's been nice. And move on to the next model. Okay? You were very useful, and that was the end of it. Okay. So in this case, each segment oscillator is a simple limit cycle oscillator, stable, nonlinear oscillator. may be true, but it's not important. Okay. It may be chaotic. I don't know if it's chaotic. I doubt it. Because chaotic systems, eh, it may be chaotic, but they're not as easy to study. So we'll assume that it's not chaotic. Okay. <coughs> the oscillator can be described by a single parameter, the phase angle around the limit cycle. It has 360 degrees. All you need to know is how far around you've gone. We know this is not true, but it's very hard to fix. So we're just going to assume this is correct. So, unless somebody wants to try it elsewhere. Fine, but back show. Okay? Next. The coupling function is relatively weak. Periodic function. That H function is relati relatively weak function. We know that this is false. This has now been shown to be false. It took us a long time to prove that. We now know it is false. This is an important assumption ways around it, but not for all cases, and we now know it is very strong. So this is a very incorrect assumption. The weak. Yeah, the weak coupling is, is not correct. It can't work with weak coupling. You don't get the results that we see with the traveling wave with weak coupling. You have to have very strong coupling. Okay. All right. Now what else? Uh, now, Tim Kimmel, I think I got his Tim, yeah, um, 
what he did was he went and he estimated. I've been working with him now, oh my God, since 1985, something like that. I don't even remember. He was a student of Phillips, and we've been working ever since he was a student of Phillips, and he then came with me to, Cornell, uh, to Maryland, and he's been working there with some other people, but he's still doing the mathematics with me. And he took it upon himself to estimate the real coupling. Estimating the real coupling, you can't, there's too many cells. There are many, 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 many cells. Even in a lamprey spinal cord, you have more cells than you can record from. So you cannot define the real system. There are too many cells. You cannot say, all right, it's in, in the leech. You can say, well, there's these five or 10, 20, 30 cells. You can do that in a leech. You can do that in an invertebrate. This is a vertebrate. In even a relatively simple invertebrate, there's still a 1,000 cells per segment, and Lord only know how many fibers are coming in and going out of that single segment. So you cannot determine the real coupling. All you can do is measure it, and that's what he did. So he used two oscillators and he added noise, and this is the noise term. And he did a maximal likelihood analysis. Uh, I think that's going to be, yeah, I think that I say that in the next, yeah. So he developed a maximal likelihood method to find the best values for the parameters. And he had to do this completely from scratch. He did not know statistics, but he understood that this was the only way he could possibly attack the problem, and he did. And it's a beautiful piece of work that many people have asked us about uh, because when you have a rhythmic system to get, to do analysis, a statistical analysis on the rhythmic system is very difficult because these are not independent terms. And most systems in statistics, you assume independence between the two things that you're measuring. This system has no independence between the, se the segments. So you can't assume anything like that. So you have to develop new methods, and that's what he did. So he developed, um, in this way, he measured the total coupling strength and the relative ascending fraction as opposed to the descending fraction. He also got the descending fraction. And this was Tim's work, and it's absolutely beautiful work. Uh, yes. Just to make sure that I again yeah. told you, I, I thought that you said in the beginning that when you cut the fibers, yeah. both ways, in the center and the side, yes. sometimes you get, so you there preserve no ascending anymore, and there is no, so how does it continue? If you assume that they are sending out the coupling, you cut the coupling. Oh, no, no, no. What he's no, he's leaving the coupling together. No, no, it's an experiment. Yeah, so but it's an experiment. Yeah. You cut the fibers. That's right. And still you go, you go in some cases. You don't, you don't necessarily get the original traveling wave. You preserve coupling. I do not say and I do not claim that the coupling is the same. But there are still coupling or those are There is fibers. still coupling. No, there's still fibers. Oh, there even, still fibers. yeah, because even within those cellular regions, oh, there are. There are fibers so that are going in and coming out. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a few fibers that are traveling through, and they're also coming in and going out from that region. So it, you can't necessarily say that there's no fibers going in or out. Okay? Thank you for asking that. That's a good question. Um, okay. So in this way, he measured the relative fractions ascending and descending. And most people would like to claim or like to think about, it's easier to think about a descending coupling if you think about it, this is what makes sense, okay, that you've got this descending wave, and therefore you have a descending traveling wave, and therefore descending coupling. But it's not the way the system is built. You have both ascending and descending, and you need that ascending in order to make it stable. So it's, it's really crucial. And anatomically, we can prove it, that you need the ascending. Okay. Uh, more about assumptions. <coughs> Model needs long-range coupling to provide the total coupling strength of the real cord. Yes, long-range coupling is very important. Model will need to be tweaked, get the phase delays correct. And here we now have Kath Kathleen Hoffman and Tim working together, uh, doing some very nice modeling to formulate a new model that incorporates the new data. And there have been more experiments. These are the experiments have been going on, uh, going on now for many years and they, they're taking all the data, especially some new experiments. 
just done by Eric Titel, the postdoc in my lab, who did some very nice experiments where he collected all kinds of new data that they're putting into a new model. So, okay. And now just models of lamprey spinal cords by others uh, have assumed one-way coupling known to be false. Uh, they unclear what strengths and directions are specified in their models. So, never mind. A note of caution. We cannot identify nor record from all the coupling fibers. You can't do it. There's too many. We cannot identify the strengths and lengths of all the coupling fibers. We must indirectly measure the strengths. You can't do it directly. You can only do it indirectly. So, what? Well, what I would say first is that you need a team approach to do this work. It cannot be done by just physiologists. <coughs> you need difficult and often tailor-made statistics. You need sophisticated mathematics, nonlinear mathematics, for example. You need physiologists to measure indirect activity for analysis. Okay, so the beginning, this was the beginning of my interdisciplinary journey. And needless to say, the biologists <coughs> did not understand it, to say the least, but they now do, and especially the youngsters. To the youngsters, I have been defined as a legend. I think it's kind of fun to be a legend while you're still alive. It's great fun. In any case, I was actually introduced as a legend in one of the talks I gave. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I wasn't even tottering up to this stage. It was great fun. Okay. Now, okay, on to engineers and Telluride. Who could turn down an image like this? That's what Telluride is, and Roe can tell you. In 1994, engineers wanted my input for a neuromorphic engineering workshop. First, you might ask, what is neuromorphic engineering? And I understand your question. This is the school where we would learn about it, and this is where we went every day for three weeks. Engineering, what we do with neuromorphic engineering is we engineer smart devices using simple principles of, of neuroscience. We may not mimic the biology, but we embody the principles. That's the critical piece. Okay. How am I using it? Because there are many people doing very different things. I'm trying to build smart devices that control movement. Okay. That's my part. Um, and I'm using principles derived from the lamprey. And principles, I will claim that principles are like morphological properties. Principles have evolved the same as anatomical components. <coughs> I claim. That's a claim I make. I can't prove it, but I claim it. Implementation of principles can and does vary from system to system. That I can prove. Like, for example, you have feed forward and feedback control in all of these systems implemented in different ways, like the cockroach, the lamprey, the cat, and the human. I claim that those are going to be implemented differently, but they're all doing the same thing. Okay, that's one thing. Okay, oscillators are limit cycle oscillators. That we know. I've shown you that ad nauseum. Um, they're stable to perturbations. That's very important. Frequencies can be varied with forcing, so you can change their frequencies, but not trivially. The nature of the coupling one can use for such a system, we now have ideas what that coupling should look like. So, neuromorphic engineering, is it different from <coughs> neuroscience? Uh, yeah, I think it is. In motor systems, the principles matter regardless of the implementation. So in motor systems, regardless of whether it's an engineered system or a wetware system, it's these principles that matter. And that's the claim that I'm making. Now, the output is, a, and, this is a, and this is why I'm making the claim, the output of a motor system is always the product of the input. The output has to fit the need, and whatever comes in has to match in order to get a, a reasonable output that makes sense. Otherwise, it's useless. The system <coughs> principles will alter the reading of sensory inputs. So exactly how you read those inputs will differ from system to system, but you will have to somehow get to the output that you want. And you must accommodate the position at the onset. So 
So if I'm standing on this foot, if I get perturbed in this leg, I better not move this leg or I'm going to fall flat on my face. Right? That's the point of... Um, what's the, what's the, I've been saying this. Um, Phase-dependent perturbations. The, fa the, depend the perturbation damn well better be dependent on where you are when it comes. So that when you're in this position, you don't try <coughs> to jump off this leg to find your balance or you'll be flat on your face. Okay? You first put this leg down and then you pick this one up. Okay? If it's this one and it comes in, then you're going to kick it. Okay, fine. You don't have to pick up this one first. That's phase dependent. The same response gets a different output depending on the input, depending on where you are in the cycle. Okay? Very simple principle. Okay. How has this all worked? So, you begin to build devices first with simple aspects of spinal function. Implement simple CPG with only bursting and alternation in one segment. Okay, simple start. This is my collaborator, Ralph Etienne Cummings, and you met him, I think, Rowie, at the, at the meeting. Great guy. Uh, we'll hear more from him later. And this is his chip showing the output on, and some of you may have seen this on CNN International. It was on CNN International they interviewed us, and it was just not so long ago. And he played this uh, to demonstrate it. It's a simple capacitor that charges up, then runs off, and then recharges, and just keeps going around. There are excitatory inputs, inhibitory inputs, <coughs> that will give you phase-dependent responses, as we'll see. And these are synapses, so-called synapses. Okay? Very simple. The real chip <coughs> looks like this. And the chip outlook, the chip, the real chip is 1.2 microns and uses less than one microwatt of power. These are analog chips, not digital. And this is what we were doing at the workshop. We do analog chips whenever possible, not dogmatically, but they're much more efficient. And this particular one is definitely an analog chip. <coughs> so it worked immediately. This, you know, most experiments, I hate to say this, most, I'm sure that anyone who does wetware experiments knows this, most experiments do not work the first time you do them, unless it works the first time and then you come back six months later to get the second ex successful experiment, which sometimes happens, ironically. But it's almost never the case that things work immediately. This did. We controlled the legs immediately. It had a passive knee, and this little robot was by Tony Lewis, who's pictured there, and the sensors at the hip were by Mitra Hartman, who's there, and they were all at the workshop, and this was the little robot that you'll see in a minute, and this is the, uh, the simple design circuit that we had, and these are nonlinear sensors that Mitra put on here. Uh, she's gone on to work on whiskers, done some very beautiful work on whiskers. Um, and the actuators, there's only actuators at the hip. The knee is simply swinging passively. And in fact, our knee is largely a passive knee. And when they make prosthetic legs, they often now use a, a passive knee because it's just as effective as an active knee and is less trouble to, to try to control. So, um, and this is a little learning synapse down there. So uh, this you now is our, when the light is on, the sensors are on. And you see it's working very, this is one leg and it's working very well. Light goes off, starts to get trouble. The hand of God comes and picks it up, puts it back, light comes back on, all is well. Okay, so this is, this is the, the little leg. And this is looking at the details of that up over there. So, so what are the actuators here? Uh, basically, it's just the hip, so it's just uh, one degree of freedom, really. It's no, very simple. Not, um, I don't think there's two degrees. What would be the second degree here? Um, no, because it can't go this way. It could only go this way, and the knee is not doing anything except passive, and the ankle is just hitting the ground. So really, just one degree of freedom. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We'll see more complicated <laughs> robots in a bit, but this one has only one. Yeah. It's getting feedback from the running. Uh, yeah, from the knee. Yeah, it's getting feedback from the knee. The running uh, meal is, is giving it the force, and that's causing. Yeah, that's, that's right. Well, that's. Um, yeah, only in the sense. Let's, let's run that again just a minute. So it's really only. It's, it's yeah? You have passive degrees of <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you could say right. that. Yeah, you could say that's that. There's a force coming in from the. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Let's talk about this later because I'd be curious to 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 get what you're you mean. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, I'm certainly talking about active degrees. Yeah, okay. Okay, now, uh, here it is. Two, biped. Pretty good. And this is mirrored control. So it's not really, there's no coupling yet. It's just, you know, just using mirrored control across. We'll see others in a minute. Um, okay, and this now is the model for two degree, for two limbs. And it's really just the two limbs coupled together across the coupling. And other than that, it's the same as we've seen. And now you'll see what it looks like with the coupling. OK. Now here, come on. Go oh, ahead. Excuse me. Okay. Now. That's unilateral coupling. Now. Bidirectional coupling. Very simple device. Uh, yes, because in fact it is. Uh, so there, I agree with you. And certainly, you know, the force is coming in, and it's changing the sensory input. So it is responding to the speed of the sound. No. Okay. Now. So, sorry. Yeah. Just sure. There are. What are the, the sensors? There are sensors, but they don't feed back to the operator. They do. They do. Oh, absolutely. And the feedback is the the north, the force, the magnitude of the force. No, it's the angle. Just the angle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here. So it's just like asymmetric gay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's Ralph. <laughs> Great colleague. Three, two, one. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Got it. Cool. Now that was with coupling. You can see the difference with it, with and without. Okay. Okay. Now these are just some cool. This is if you get the sensors on. <laughs> <laughs> what we call the hurdle jumper. <laughs> off the spot. And this is the over the top spot. <laughs> You like that one, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> you can see what can go wrong. Oh, it's all that stuff It can go very wrong. Okay, never mind. That's fun. Okay, onward. <coughs> On to Japan and an autonomous quadruped. This is work I did with Hiroshi Kimura and his students, uh, Yasuhiro, Hiri, uh, Yasuhiro Fukuoka and in the development of Tekken, which means iron dog. Um, and I should preface this by saying that uh, Hiroshi came up to me at a talk where I had given a talk on the sensory feedback uh, of, you know, of spinal locomotion, and he really wanted to understand what this was all about. Because in Japan, the robots are built there using what's called zero moment control. I think it's what it is. I think that's the, the term for it. They take the robots very seriously, but they really have not been particularly in contact with biologists until recently. And um, Hiroshi wanted to not understand what the biology was doing, and we began a collaboration, which was great fun, um, and it really has been great. So, Iron Dog. And here is the Iron Dog. Uh, come on, let's get him. Come on, come on, come on, go ahead. Go. 
Come on. Oh, stop it. Behave yourself. Let me see what's happening. It's got this thing in front of it. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Great. Okay, this is yes to do. This is obviously you can see this is a very uneven terrain. And he's got the, the leash to, to be on the animal, I think the animal protected is uh, just it's just a cord, it's not controlled. The, uh, the, the computer is on board and you, know, you can see it's walking in this remarkably irregular terrain. And it comes to this and it says, Well, I think we're not gonna go any farther. That's fine. Okay. But it did really well. You know, that's that's pretty good. Now, the next and um, this one is this <laughs> So here's something about how it was done. Uh, joints and muscles have compliance. Very nice, nicely done with their compliance. And easy mutual entrainment between the CPG and the properties of the, of the limbs. That was one of the nice things that, uh, that they wanted to do. And the joints and actuators are built to provide compliance. And this is something that we often, in the States I know, have a great deal of trouble with is the compliance of muscle. And uh, they are using, um, you know, th there's nothing very sophisticated really uh, actuators are near optimal for back drivability to prevent uh, damage to any external object. And the PD controller with the lookup table to provide appropriate force given position when muscle is activated. And then this all falls out with uh, these kinds of adaptable um, irregular terrain. 
and if anybody's interested, this is the uh, the diagram of, of the uh, of how it was put together. Um, now Yasu has. Oh, I hope I'm online because he's going off to his own lab, and uh, come on, yeah. And he's doing this really nice biped, which hopefully will work now. It didn't last time I went to try it, but it did before that, so I'm hoping it'll work now. He's a very creative young man, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to be a co-author on the paper. <laughs> I said yes. <laughs> so I am a co-author in this. Okay, yes, loading. <coughs> Hopefully. Oh, come on. It looks like it's not going to work. Damn. It's okay. It's Just let it... Okay. Just take time. Okay. I'm impatient. The nice thing about this, though, is it is a biped. And bipeds... Bipedal robots are very difficult to build because, you know, you've got, you know, we have all kinds of vestibular and various kinds of... say that a biped is very difficult because you have you have the difficulty of balance. Most of the bipeds that have been done, um, well, I, I don't have a picture of one, but the usual way of getting around that is by putting weights in the feet. It's a very common trick to make a biped. Mm -hmm. And it's it works. You know, it, it, it works, but it's a kludge. It's not, it's not what we do. Our, you know, I mean, have relatively big feet, but they're not that big that they're like a paddle on, on the bottom of your foot. This guy, this biped, bipedal dinosaur, if you will, is very well balanced. And I suspect he's done it by putting the, the weight on. If you look back at, let's, um, and what I have to do is go back to it. Yeah, if you look at how it's built, what he's done is he's put weight above and, and below the, the legs. So, in fact, it is probably balanced, and he's got gyros in there as well. So it's, uh, but it's a very clever device. So, uh, and that is basically it. Um, yeah, I'll just stop there. And that is a lamprey. So I guess they did did come after all. So thank you all. Any other questions? Everybody understood every word. Good. <laughs> or nothing, which is the other Why part. Why did they do yeah. dinosaurs instead of, say, human legs or something interesting? Um, <laughs> well, probably because human legs, uh, Honda is doing human legs. And I actually talked to Honda because their robot, uh, um, what's, his, what's his name? Kowato. Asimo. What? Kowato in the... In the yeah, Kowato. Yeah. Well, Kowato, isn't he doing... Um, I'm trying to think. So I was part of... As a consequence of this what work... Humanoids. Yeah. Um, well, there's a bunch of people that are doing humanoids. In, in, But what they do is they use... The principles that they use, it's very peculiar because the methods they're using is to mimic the action rather than to put in any kind team. of... That's right. Rather than to build any kind of basic control control structure, they're just mimicking what what is seen, and so the 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 result of this is that they're totally non-independent. <coughs> they can only do what they've seen. They cannot respond to sensory feedback, for example, like uh, Asimo, the, um, the Honda robot. I met Asimo, and he shook my hand. I will not say that I shook his hand because he just takes your hand and. <laughs> There's no, he's not responding to anything. And, you know, he walks upstairs beautifully because he's mimicking how people walk upstairs. But if he were to trip over something, 
and he'd be flat on his face, so to speak. So um, I'm very uncompelled. I was on the uh, steering committee for a, a big um, uh, Japan-wide uh, grant on mobiligens, which is a wonderful concept of uh, intelligence through movement. And uh, it was a, a huge group of universities from across the, 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 the country uh, looking at both roboticists and biologists and mathematicians and all kinds of people. And um, Stan and I and Rolf Pfeiffer, I don't know if any of you know Rolf, he's a, he does passive robots, a uh, very interesting guy, uh, were the steering committee for this, for this grant. And they turned out some very interesting stuff because, in fact, they were working very closely across all these boundaries and really trying to incorporate what they were seeing. And the biology that they were getting into things was just beautiful. I was so impressed. I think that they're going to be just way ahead of us, ultimately, because they, take, they do take their robots seriously, and we don't in the U.S. You know, it's just they're, they're either for industry or something else I'm unsure of, but not very seriously. And I don't know about in Israel. I don't know anybody who's doing robots in Israel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. question from Marshall. And, uh, yeah. yeah, you had a question, Marshall. Yeah. You said that going back to your real animals, yes. your lambs, Squishies. You need quite strong coupling between yes. the segments. Yes, that's right. It's not intuitively obvious that you say that that's, that's your position at least. That's right. Well, that's what's there. That, that no, it's not so that that's position. That's what's there. That's what we've measured. If that's so, yeah. then when you make these various cups, yes. I would have thought the more you cut, the less coupling you get. Yes. And that the, the pattern of, of decay of the coupling, the pattern yes. of the oscillations, yes. would, would somehow change in, in an obvious and informative way as you make larger and larger cuts. The problem with that is, in tech, you know, technically you're correct. There's no, then that was why we did it originally. But the problem was that it's very difficult to actually do that in practice because <coughs> the cord is, the cord, I never mentioned, the cord is all of a millimeter wide. So to... Isn't a microelectrode make a little burn? Uh, but the, the, the fibers are not all in the same place. This is, this is a real... You know, our fibers are not all in the same place, and their fibers are not all in the same place. It's just not the case. So you can try, but it's not going to give you anything obvious. So it, I don't think it would, you know, I would love for that to be true, but I just, you know, <coughs> and also I'll let somebody else do it if they want. Yes, back to this. In your model, did you cut the, you do you the model, you did the model the coupling? Did you cut the, the connection there? Say it again. Start again. I'm sorry. Model, your show model. Yes. You do with uh, like snake shape. Yes. Did you cut the connection there and saw the result? What happened there? If you I'm not sure I'm understanding yeah. your question. If you cut the connections in the model, what happens? Ah, um, yeah, well, that's actually the kind of thing that Tim and Kathleen have done and are doing uh, in their modeling now. They are making models, and they're looking at what happens as you reduce the model to see what exactly uh, you emerges from that. Uh, because we now have much more data on uh, something like what you're talking about, Mark, uh, but not the same thing. Um, because it turns out that the coupling along the body, if you measure along from segment to segment, is actually different. It's not uniform in terms of the, the, the traveling wave and so on. So they're trying to get this to come out, and in so doing, they're changing things and seeing what it takes to get that, which is similar to the kind of question that you're asking, only the other way around. So they're now tweaking and whatever to try to get the data uh, to emerge from the model. Uh, but it's non-trivial, because it turns out when you're using strong coupling, the mathematics gets much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So, in all those robots, yeah. there's actually no learning at all. No. So yeah, in these there is, there is in these are there are not, there is not no. Uh, certainly, I think that robots that are being built uh, currently do have learning in them. They're trying to put in learning. There's no question that this is something that they want to put in. Um, this is more. These were more demonstrations than, uh, and you know, just to show that it can be done. That you can get a very nice, you know, uh, adaptable. Autonomous so quadruple. The process was just due to the nonlinearity. I mean, the, the stable limits are. Yeah, and the and the stability of the equations. Yeah, yeah. 
That's right, which is very nice, and which is you know part of how Hiroshi originally designed it, and it's it's a, a beautiful system. Yeah, did I see one other question here? No, oh, somebody getting their coat on. Okay. okay. <laughs>